Hey, Rob, my students just told me that I'm the best AP Computer Science Day teacher at my school. That's amazing. My students told me today that I'm the best AP Computer Science Day teacher at my school. Great. Wait, 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 wait. How, how many computer science teachers are there at your school, Tim? Ooh, there's just me. Me, me too. You know, so, I, that's I, all right. I'll, I'm going to take, take it and run with it. Yep, yep. Yep. Good enough. Good enough. Yep. Hey, everybody. <laughs> welcome to AP Daily Live 2022, the AP Computer Science A review session videos here. My name is Tim Gallagher, and I teach at Winter Springs High School near Orlando, Florida. And I am Rob Schultz. I teach at Bellbrook High School in Bellbrook, Ohio. And welcome. We're so glad to have you here as we get ready for the AP Computer Science A exam. Uh, this is day four for us here. And before we get started, we have uh, some very important shout outs to uh, send out to some students uh, around the world that we know are listening to us. And so let's give a shout out to uh, Lincoln Park High School in Chicago, Illinois. OK, and how about Barrington High School in Barrington, Illinois? And the School for the Talented and Gifted in Dallas, Texas. Okay, and how about Ray Kushner Yeshiva High School? Sorry, also, I don't have a city or state on that one. That's all right. We've got a North Shore uh, Senior High School in Houston, Texas. Okay, and what about Seton Hall Prep in West Orange, New Jersey? Awesome, and a shout out to Lyons Township High School in LaGrange, Illinois. Welcome. Welcome. And Thank you so much for, for watching our video series. I hope you're getting a lot out of it as we get you ready for the AP Computer Science A exam coming up really soon. So let's get started, Rob, what do you say? Yeah, sounds great. All right, so we're gonna start with what will we learn? And in today's video, we're gonna start off as always with our bit of the day. We are going to uh, look at the AP Classroom and AP Daily Videos resources that we have on AP Classroom. Then we're going to have our review and we're gonna focus on nested for loops today. Uh, followed by our multiple choice question review. And then today's free response question will be the array resizer uh, 2D array question from the 2021 exam. So Rob, why don't you take it away with the bit of the day? Okay, let's see. Let me grab your screen here. Got it. Okay, so um, for today's bit of the day, I wanted to spend some time looking at some of the resources that are available to you on AP Classroom. So specifically, um, we're going to take a very quick look at First and foremost, the help screen and the AP Student Guide to AP Classroom, where you'll get some instructions on how AP Classroom works. We're going to look at the dreaded to-do bar. That's where your uh, teacher may or may not have assigned some work for you to do. Um, and then we're going to look at some of the course resources out there. We're going to look at faculty lectures and labs and some videos and progress checks and some other things. So um, so Maggie's here to kind of guide us a little bit. Um, so let's go out and, and let's take a look. I'm going to change the share on my screen, and I'm going to jump over if I can find it to here. So I have a fictional class. This is not my class. This is not my student. This is a fictional class and a fictional student. Um, and I wanted to point out a couple of different things. So when you log in as a student, um, your view is going to be a little different than your teacher's view. So this is what you as a student will see. And the first thing I wanted to point out was this help and AP student guide. So when you click this little button up at the top that has the question mark, this is your help menu. And here you're going to find some things, step-by-step um, -step instructions and videos on how to get the most out of AP Classroom. Um, and there's also a, a contact us about an issue. Now, I need to stress that this is not where you go if you have questions about the exam or about rubrics or about scoring or anything like that. This is strictly for tech issues. If you're having a, a hard time getting into AP uh, Classroom, if there's some technical issue, these go to the technical support team for AP Classroom. So that would be where you would put uh, um, any, any specific tech problems that you're having. So that's the help menu. That's our starting spot. Um, the other thing that's really nice about AP Classroom is this first thing you see is this scrolling um, to-do bar across the top. And like I said, this is where you'll see things that maybe your teacher has assigned for you to work on. So, so my fictional student, um, Rob Anderson, um, has a video assigned, a welcome video. There's a progress check. Um, there are three AP Daily videos to watch. Uh, that look like they're for unit two and maybe another one for unit one and here's one for unit one. Okay, so this is where you'll find things that your teacher has assigned for you to work on. Um, but the thing I really, really wanted to focus on were the, the resources that you'll find over here down this menu on the left. Okay, so let's start at the top and kind of work our way down. 
The first one is the overview menu, and you'll see this little option at the bottom for student resources. The first thing you're going to notice are all of these AP Daily videos, and these are university faculty lecture videos. So for every unit, um, College Board asked one um, university professor to provide some information um, from, from their perspective on the topics covered in that specific unit. And each video I want to say is roughly around 45 minutes to an hour long, but there's some great insight into things that you might find from college professors that relate to some of these specific topics from unit one all the way down to unit 10. The other thing you're going to find is this is where you'll find um, if you wanted to get some practice with some lab work that that your teacher might or might not have assigned. This is where you'll find the 2019 College Board Labs um, consumer review data and steganography. And then there's also a copy of the exam reference sheet, which we'll be talking about in a later video. OK, um, the second thing I wanted to point out after you get through the overview is I wanted to look at what you find with the specific units. So each unit is broken down by topic, so you can get additional information for any specific topic. And each topic has its own set of AP Daily videos that go with them. And these videos are great because they're just a 10 minute roughly snapshot of the specific topic that's being addressed. So if I wanted to look at, for example, unit eight, and I went to traversing 2D arrays and I wanted a little more information about how we would traverse a 2D array. I can go out and I can click on that specific topic and I've got three videos. Um, you know, the first video covers specifically skill 3E and it, and it gives a great description. In this video, we're going to demonstrate how nested iteration statements can be used to traverse and access all of the elements in 2D arrays. Um, in the second video, uh, we look at how we explore, um, we're going to explore how nested iteration statements can be used to traverse 2D arrays in row major order versus column major order. And when you click it, the video pops up. And well, look at that. It's our buddy, Tim. Hey, hey. Tim, you're in two places at once. How do you do that? All right, so so there's where you can find um, there's where you can find specific, just very very specific um, videos that cover the specific topics that are in each one of the units, and then finally, um, when you go down to the very bottom after unit ten is review. You can look at on demand review and the videos that you see here these eight videos are from last year's. AP Daily Live. So this year we're doing eight videos for the 2022 edition. These videos are the 2021 edition. And so if you, um, you know, if you watch one of our videos and you you think to yourself, boy, I'd, I'd really like to get a little more information on that topic, you can go out and you can find the related video out in the 2021 area under AP Daily videos to to get a second look at at some of the same topics that we're talking about this year, just maybe a different spin. So um, so I'm going to go ahead and jump back. Uh, let's see, I'm going to stop share and I'm going to go to there. So, um, so that's our bit of the day for today. Um, just again, some general resources that might help you with some review um, and being able to go back and, and check some more information and uh, some, some videos that might help you with some of the specific topics that we might not have enough time to cover in just the short amount of time that we have together in the 2022 edition of AP Daily Live. So hopefully you find those helpful. Um, I know I have in my own classroom. So there you go. I'm going to turn things back over to you, Tim. Awesome. All right. Thanks for that, Rob. And now it is time for our review. And today we're going to talk about nested for loops. And nested for loops can get a little complicated. So what are they? That's really uh, nested for loops are used when you want to iterate through two dimensions, as it says, something like rows and columns, or really any time you want to have an iteration within another iteration. As Maggie's saying down there on the bottom of the screen, a loop and a loop and a loop and a loop. You can have as many uh, nested loops as you want. Um, generally, though, we think of nested loops as an outer loop with an inner loop. And you can have more, but we're going to focus on those, a loop inside of a loop. and What's really important to note about these nested for loops or just nested loops in general is that for each singular iteration of an outer loop, the inner loop completes uh, or goes through a complete iteration cycle um, of the inner loop for every single iteration of the outer loop. So let's look at an example here to give a better explanation and, and to kind of show what we're doing here. So um, here's an example. I've written some code. I've got a for loop uh, that um, starts off with outer equals one to three and then outer plus plus. And that is my outer loop. And then if you'll notice inside of that loop itself, I've got my curly braces. I, I do a print line, which we'll get to in a minute. And then there's another loop uh, for 
int inner equals one, inner less than or equal to five, and that is going to be my inner loop. So I've got a loop inside of a loop here. That is my nested for loop examples. And what happens when I run this code? Well, we start off with, here's my execution box. Um, I start off with the outer loop and the outer loop, which we said outer goes from one to three. So outer is going to be one. And notice I'm going to print line and I put some, I put the word outer. I'm going to print that uh, variable and I put some asterisks around it just to kind of differentiate it. So um, it's going to print out one with a couple of asterisks on either side. And now it's going to hit my inner loop and the inner loop which is inner and it's going to go from one to five it's going to execute the entire loop and and inside that loop there you'll notice that it prints out the variable inner and it's going to print out one two three four and five and notice it's a print not a print line statement so it's going to print out uh, each value of inner with a space after it, and it's going to iterate all the way through that inner loop now when it's finished it then goes back up to the outer loop and outer plus plus, now my value of outer is going to be two, and it prints out a two, which then leads us back into my inner loop, and it's going to print out again, reset it, and print out the entire inner loop, one, two, three, four, five. And then again, repeating one last time, outer is now going to be three, and it prints out a three, and then it goes into my inner loop, and it prints out one, two, three, four, and five. So you'll notice for each iteration of my outer loop, the inner loop does a complete cycle all the way through one, two, three, four, five, and then outer increments each time through as well too. And that's our basic uh, demonstration of of a loop inside of a loop, our nested for loops there. So. Um, what happens if I switch it up though a little bit? What if I switch those numbers, the three and the five, if I make my outer loop five and my inner loop three? Think about what that's gonna look like. Same print statements, right? But instead of having one and then one through five and then two and then three and one through five, now it's going to print one, one, two, three, two, one, two, three, three, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, and five, one, two, three. So notice my outer loop is now going to go from one to five that's with the asterisks and the inner loop goes from one to three each time so if you think of them in terms of rows and columns the other example had three rows and five columns and this example it's offset a little bit but again it's five rows and three columns here and that's an example of our nested for loop now what about this let's really switch it up rob you ready for this I'm ready. Make, make sure your seatbelt's buckled, okay? For this example, I'm hey, gonna I'm keep my I'm gonna keep my outer loop at five, but my inner loop, inner is gonna start at one, but inner is gonna be less than or equal to outer. Is so that even now, legal? It, you know what? In most states, it is. In most states, um, Florida and Ohio. I already checked. We're, we're clear. And okay. on the AP exam, it's also legal. So Got it. what's going to happen here is let's think about it. My outer loop is going to go from one to five again still, but my inner loop is not just going to go one to three, one to three, one to three. It's going to go from one to whatever the current value of outer is. So when outer is one, I'm going to go from one to one. When outer is two, I'm going to go from one to two. When outer is three, if so on and so on. And so what's my output going to look like now? Think about it for a second. And there it is, right? So now we've got this kind of this triangle shape because my inner loop is different each time based on what my outer loop's going to be. And that gives us a little bit of a, uh, of a different look for, um, for my nested for loops here. All right. So, um, that's a great example of, of, of for loops and how those look. Um, if you look at the AP daily videos that uh, Rob just mentioned, uh, Sandy Chaika does a great job on um, the unit about for loops that does nested for loops with the idea of a clock, an analog clock, about how the, the, the hour changes every time the minutes go through 60 minutes. So I highly recommend checking that out as well. So one last thing I want to talk about is since we're going to be doing 2D arrays a lot in this particular video, I want to talk about using uh, nested for loops to traverse through a two-dimensional array in what we call row major order. Now, this is a slide actually off of one of the videos I did for uh, AP Daily, and you'll notice that I have in this video, I've got, or in this slide, I've got an outer loop and an inner loop. The outer loop is going to be for each row of my 2D array, 
and the inner loop is going to be for each column within each row of my 2D array. So what happens when I run this? Well, I'm going to have my row and my column variables like we've done before so I can trace through. And notice as I'm going through this uh, each column within each row, I'm just going to print out the contents of my two-dimensional array that I've called grid here. Now you'll notice that I've given you a, just a sample grid down there at the bottom. It's just the letters of the alphabet, A, B, C, D, E, all the way through. So when row is zero and column is zero, it's going to print out an A. And then what happens? Column advances to one right because that's my inner loop so it prints out row zero column one which is a b and then column two which is c column three which is d and column four which is e and then when it gets to column five there is no column five right because that's so i'm no longer i'm done with my inner loop and then it goes back up to my outer loop which means i'm at row one now but now column is going to go again through zero one two three four and five which again, there is no column five, so I'm done with that loop now. And then I'm gonna do the same thing for row two, and I'm gonna do the same thing for row number three. And again, incrementing through all the columns within each row, and this would be a way of traversing a 2D array in what we call row major order. And we'll talk more about 2D arrays in the uh, free response question that we do. Um, at the end. And then, of course, once row gets to four, I'm done because there is no row four in this 2D array and the traversal is now finished. And that's a slight review, a small review about nested loops, and you'll see they come in very, very handy. So, Rob, I'm going to turn it back over to you and uh, let's do some practice. Okay, you're right, Tim. Those are going to come in really handy because when we start looking at some practice of multiple choice questions, the 2D, um, the 2D array traversals and the nested for loops that you just shared are going to pop up all over the place. So here's a good example. Okay, um, we've got our first multiple choice, and it says we want to consider the following code segment. So we've got a 2D integer array called my array that has six rows and five columns. And then as Tim just showed us, we've got our nested for loops with the idea being that we're gonna traverse our, uh, our 2D array in row major order. And as we get inside the inner for loop, we're gonna replace each element of our array with whatever the, the value representing the row and column, in this case, it's J and K. We're gonna replace the value at position JK with the sum of those index positions. Okay, now there's a problem, and maybe you've seen the problem already based on the example that Tim just shared. This code isn't correct. It's going to cause an array index out of bounds exception to be thrown. Okay, we're going to hit a certain point when this is just going to crash. So the question that we're to answer, how many elements in my array will be set to a value before we throw that exception? Will it be one, five, six, or 30? Okay, so before I go any further, I'm going to give you a chance to press pause, and I want you to take a couple minutes, see if you can trace through the code um, using some of the, the tips that Tim has already shared, and see if you can identify at what point this is going to crash and how many elements will actually be set before it crashes. Okay, so go ahead and press pause, and when you're ready to play, um, when you're ready to come back, press play, and we'll, we'll do some review. And we are back. Did you find it? Did you see where it's going to throw the air? Okay, so let's play with this a little bit. So we start out by creating a 2D integer array called my array. So here is a 2D integer array called my array. We've got six rows indexed from zero to five, and we've got five columns within each row indexed from zero to four. All right. So we start out with our loop control variable J, and we're going to set that equal to zero. There we go. Um, and we're going to traverse, uh, I should say, we're going to iterate through the outer loop as long as j is less than myarray.length. Well, myarray.length tells us how many rows, and there are six rows. So as long as j is less than six, we're going to continue inside the outer for loop, and we're going to take a look at the inner for loop. So once we hit the inner for loop, the first thing we do as we come into uh, as we come into this for loop is we set a loop control variable k equal to zero. So there's k. But take a look at what's going on here, and maybe you notice the subtle little difference between this example and the example that Tim just did. This is also telling us that we're going to continue to traverse the inner, or I should say iterate the inner for loop as long as k is less than my array dot length. Well, again, that's not looking at the number of columns, that's looking at the number of rows. So again, we're going to keep going as long as k is less than six. 
All right. So because zero, our value for K is less than six, we're going to go into the inner for loop and we're going to identify the value at position zero, zero. And we're going to set it equal to the value of zero plus zero. OK, um, everything's looking good. So we're going to come back up and we're going to increment K to one. One is still less than six. So we're going to come back into the loop and we're going to identify the element at position zero, one. And we're going to fill it with the value or we're going to set it to the value zero plus one, which is one. And we're going to continue this process. So K becomes two. Two is less than six. So we're going to identify the value at or the element at position zero, two. And we're going to um, set it to the value of zero plus two, which is two. We're going to increment our loop control variable to three. We're going to identify the element at position zero, three. And we're going to set it equal to the value of zero plus three, which is three. And we've got one left. We're going to increment our loop control variable to four. We're going to go to position zero, four and set it to the value of four. But look what happens next. We're going to increment our loop control variable one more time to five. And we're going to try to identify the element at position zero, five. And there is no element at position zero, five. And boom, this is where we throw our array index out of bounds exception. OK, so if you're keeping track, we've filled five individual values before we hit the array index out of bounds exception. So looking at our answers, we were able to get one row complete, five columns, so five values before we threw our array index out of bounds exception. So five is our correct answer, answer B. Okay, how did everybody do? Did they find it? Okay, I hope so. So one thing to keep in mind, we have to make sure we're looking at the number of rows using myarray.length, and we have to make sure we're specifically looking for the number of columns if our intent is to go in row major order. And so let's take a look at this one. This one gives us a little better look at how we would do something like that. OK, we've got another multiple choice, and it says to consider the following data field and method. So I have a 2D integer array called 2D, and then I've got a method called what's it do. And this one, we look like we're OK. This one, um, I'm setting row equal to zero, and we're going to uh, we're going to iterate through the outer for loop while row is less than the length of 2D, which tells us the number of rows. And then inside our inner for loop is going to start columns equal to zero. And as long as column is less than the length of our first row, which tells us the number of columns. So it looks like we're OK as far as boundary errors. Um, once we go into the inner for loop, it looks like what we're doing, and this kind of goes back to what, uh, to what Tim mentioned in an earlier video, we want to look for patterns. We want to look at what the pattern is of, of what this is going to do for us. So as we go row by row, column by column, we're going to look for any place where our row index is equal to our column index. And if we find that situation, we're going to replace the value at position row column with the value that's at position row column plus one. So as columns go across, anytime we find a position or an element where the row and the column are equal, we're going to replace it with whatever the value is to its right in our 2D array. OK, so let's assume that 2D contains the following values. We've got this um, 4 by 5 2D array. And the question is, what values does 2D contain after a call to what's it do? And we've got some options. OK, so what I'd like you to do is, again, let's pause for a couple minutes See if you can trace this through, look for patterns, and see if you can identify what the correct answer is going to be, what 2D is going to look like, and what values it will contain after a call to what's it do. OK, so go ahead and press pause. And when you think you've got an answer, press play, and we'll talk a little more. And we are back. OK, so did you find a correct answer? Let's take a look. OK, um, first, let's give ourselves a little bit bigger look at this array to work with. And let's add some index positions so we can kind of see what's going on. OK, so I'm not going to go ahead and throw up the um, throw up the loop control variables like we did did the last time. I think at this point we'll be OK if we just kind of think about, again, what our pattern is. So when we start, row is going to equal zero. So we're going to focus on our top row and we want to look for any place where our row and our column are equal to each other. Well, that's going to be when row equals zero. Uh, oh, and I forgot to mention again, we've got um, we've got a length of four for rows and we've got five columns. OK, so again, we're going to be OK. We don't have to necessarily worry about boundary conditions um, and going out of bounds. So looking at our pattern, um, we're going to look for any place in row zero where I have a matching column index. And of course, that's going to be our very first element, our top left element, where row equals zero and column equals zero, um, we're going to say, OK, we've identified that value. That's a one. 
but we're going to replace that with the value that's at row and column plus one. Well, column plus one is one, and the value at that position is a two. So we're going to replace the value at position zero, zero with the value at position one, and two is going to take its spot. Okay, we're going to continue all the way to the end of row zero. We're not going to find any other place, obviously, where our column and our uh, row index index positions are going to match. So we're going to go ahead and um, increment our loop control variable for row, and we're going to take a look at row one. So again, we're going to look for the pattern. We're going to try and find where in row one our row and column are going to match. Well, that's row one, column one. And we've got a value in that element's position of three. We're going to replace that with the value at position one column plus one, which is two, and the value in that element's position is four. So we're going to replace the three with a four. And by now, hopefully, you're kind of seeing what the pattern here is. So we're going to finish out row one, and we're going to increment our row loop control variable down to row two. We're going to look for column two, because row two and column two are a match. And the element at position two, two is five. We're going to replace it with the value at, at position two, three, because that's our column plus one. So that's a one. So the five gets replaced with a one. We're going to go on to row three, and we're going to find column three. So the value at position three, three is two. And we're going to replace it with the value at position three, four, because that's our column plus one. So that value is three. And so the three ends up being copied over to replace the two. And now we increment our row loop control variable one last time to four. Well, four is no longer less than four. It's equal to four. So we're going to jump out of, of our 2D array. Um, and we're gonna, gonna jump out of the outer for loop and we're left with two, two, three, four, five, two, four, four, five, one, three, four, one, one, two, and four, five, one, one, three, which is a match for option A. So option A is the correct answer for this one. So hopefully everybody was able to identify the pattern of what was going on there and picked option A as the correct answer. All right. Okay. Uh, so Tim, I think we're ready for a, an FRQ example. Let's do it. Hey, Rob. Yeah. Why was why was the Java programmer upset at work? Oh, I'm afraid to ask, Tim. Well, well because he didn't get a raise. Uh, <laughs> that poor guy. He, he didn't get a raise. <laughs> I, I gotcha. I'm with you. <laughs> um, well, let's look at an example um so here we go uh we're gonna look at so obviously on these these videos for these first four days of our review we've been going over the 2021 exam and this is question four of the 2021 exam this is the array resizer now uh just like rob mentioned yesterday that question three was always going to be about arrays or array lists Question four will always be about 2D arrays. So this one we're going to spend a little bit of time on to make sure that uh, that we get through all the nuances and details here. So um, this is this says this question involves manipulating a two-dimensional array of integers, and you're going to write two static methods of the array resizer class, which is shown below. Now, the fact that we're writing static methods, that should kind of give you a hint. I would maybe circle that on my exam. Um, the fact that it's they're static methods, meaning I'm not going to be dealing with instance variables here. Maybe there's a uh, there's a constant, or maybe there's a static variable, but um, there won't be any instance variables. Probably, I re I'm really going to have to look at the parameters being given to the methods that I'm going to have to write. So keep that in mind as we're going through here. Um, not having to look at instance variables like some of the other free response questions we have. So first of all, it says that um, we have this first method. I'm going to blow that up a little bit here. Uh, this first method is the um, is non-zero row method. It says this is going to return true if and only if every value in row R of array 2D is non-zero. And we have our preconditions, which we've gone over before, that R is a valid row index. And our post condition is that we're not going to change the array. So that's going to be something we're going to write in part A. It's going to um, return a Boolean value, true or false, based on whether or not row R in my array 2D, 2D array, is a non-zero row. That's what we're going to do in part A. And then we also have uh, this other 
method here, which is a helper method, which we'll look at a little bit later. It's a static method that returns an int. Uh, the number, the name of the method is non is num non zero rows, and it takes in a 2D array parameter, and it's going to return the number of rows in this parameter, array 2D, that contain all non zero values. So how many rows do we have that are non-zero rows. And again, we're not going to change the array. And then finally, the last method in here is a method called resize. And again, a static method that uh, returns a 2D array. It's called resize. It takes in array 2D and it's going to return a 2D array. It says it returns a new, possibly smaller uh, two-dimensional array that contains only rows from array 2D with no zeros as described in part B. So when you go through this question on the on the free response part of the uh, of the test, Looking at the class and seeing what the methods are, are great. Once you've got an idea of what those methods are, which methods exist in the class, let's go immediately to part A and then to part B afterwards, because that's going to give us a really good explanation as to what each, what each part is going to be required to, uh, to do. So let's immediately go to part A here. So part A says we're going to write the method is non-zero row, which returns true if and only if all the elements in row R of a two-dimensional array, array 2D, are not equal to zero. And then, like a lot of our free response questions, they give you an example and some sample calls to this method. So here we have a two-dimensional array called R, which is a uh, four rows and three columns. And we're going to send this to my static method is non-zero row. So remember, we talked about calling static methods. It's going to be class dot method. So here is our call. The first one is array resizer. That's our class dot method is non-zero row R and zero. So I'm going to look to see is row zero a non-zero row. Well, in that row, there is a zero. So it's not a non-zero row. So it's going to return false. Then we're going to call is non-zero row on R and row one. And row one, well, there's no zeros in there. It is a non-zero row. So that's going to return true because all the values in row one are non-zero. And then again, we're going to call it with row two. Row two contains nothing but zeros. So that's definitely not a non-zero row. So it's going to return false. And then finally, here's the call to it uh, sending the array and on row three. And of course, row three has no zeros, so that's going to return true. So that's what our method is non-zero row is supposed to do. So based on what we just saw, can we figure that out? It says this method returns true if and only if every value in row R of array 2D is non-zero. The precondition is that we know that R is going to be a valid index, so we don't have to check for that, and we're not going to change array 2D. Now, before you write this, this is always one of those questions that you want to stop and think. We've been talking a lot about nested for loops. I did a whole uh, spiel on, on nested for loops. Rob looked at some questions that involved nested for loops. I want you to think about it before you write this question. Do I need nested for loops here? Let's think about that. And let's take a few minutes now and pause the video. And I want you to take, as Rob mentioned, since it's about 22 and a half minutes per question, um, let's go ahead and take about you know 10 minutes or so and see if you can write the method for part A. Uh, this is non-zero row method that returns a true or false based on whether or not row R is a non-zero row. So go ahead and hit pause and give it a shot and we'll go over it. All set. Need more time? Hit pause if you need more time. Okay, let's go over it now. So here we go. Let's look at part A. So do we need nested for loops here? So we've been talking, as I mentioned, we talked about nested for loops, but in this case, I'm not going to be looking at multiple rows and multiple columns. I'm only looking at a single row, but I'm not going to loop through the rows, right? I'm going to loop, loop through the columns of a single row. So here's my for loop. My for loop is going to be for int call equals zero. And then notice, this is what Rob pointed out on the multiple choice questions. Because I'm looking at the number of columns, it's going to be the name of the array, array 2D, bracket zero dot length, right? Or I could say bracket R dot length, because R is the number, is the, the row that I'm looking at. But in this case, I'm looking for the number of columns. So I need that reference, that row number in there. And I can always use zero because I know there's going to be a zero row. So as I'm going to loop through all the columns in a uh, particular row, 
what do I check? Well, I'm going to check now to see if array 2D are call. So row R and then column call, because that's what's going to change as I iterate through all the columns. If that is equal to zero, what does that mean? That means I found a zero. If I find one zero, I don't even need to check the others. We saw one example where there were all zeros. In this case, I found one zero. What can I immediately do? I can return false. Because as long as I found one, then it's not a non-zero row. If I get all the way through my loop and I have never found a zero, then what does that mean? It's a non-zero row. So what am I going to do? I'm going to return true. And that's it. So what should we look at? What are the important parts of this as, as I wrote through here that you're going to be graded on? Did you access all of your items of row? Did you go through and loop through all the columns of row R? Did you compare the items of the 2D array with a zero? And then did you return true if and only if a row contains no zeros, false otherwise? How'd you do? There's part A. Great. Let's move on. Let's look at part B. Part B is a little more complicated. So for our array resizer part B, it says we're going to write the method resize, which returns a new two-dimensional array containing only rows from array 2D with all non-zero values. The elements in the new array should appear in the same order as the order in which they appear in the original array. So again, here's an example that we're going to look at. It gives us the same array, ARRR. Um, it's a four by three two-dimensional array, and we're going to call the resize method. Notice right here, I call array resizer class dot method. It's a static method. And I send it my two dimensional array. And notice I'm capturing the return value in a new 2D array that I'm going to call smaller. Now, this is how this code is going to be used. I shouldn't see the word smaller anywhere in your code because you're just going to create a new array, call it whatever you want. But in this example, they're capturing that array in something called smaller, that 2D array we call smaller here. And what should smaller look like afterwards? Well, it should have these two rows in it. It should have row with one, three, two, and four, five, six. Why? Because those are the two rows in my original 2D array R that have no zeros. So the helper method, we have a couple of things. Our helper method, number non-row zeros has been provided. That method returns the number of rows that contain no zero values. So there's a helper method that we saw before that contains no, that uh, we can call to find out how many rows have no zeros. And then we also know that we have our is non-zero row, what we wrote. Um, it says, complete the resize method. Assume that the is non zero row works as specified regardless of what you wrote in part A. So even if you weren't sure that you did A correctly, we're going to assume that it now works and we can use it in part B. And then it says, you must use num non zero rows and is non zero row appropriately to receive full credit. Now, this is getting a little confusing. We've got num non zero rows, is non zero row, resize. Let's go back for a second. Let's look at the class that was on the previous slides. And here are two of the methods that we're gonna be using here. We're gonna be using this is non-zero row because that's the one that we just wrote in part A. And we're going to look at a row to see if there's any zeros in it. And then the other method below, this is a method that we didn't write, but it's a helper method. It's being provided. It says implementation not shown called num non-zero rows. And it tells us how many rows exist that have no zeros. And then we're going to find out which ones they are by calling the is non zero row. So normally at this point, I'd say, OK, stop the video and let's go ahead and write part B. But there's a lot here. And I want to walk through something first that I think everybody should do on the AP exam is let's think about the algorithm first. Now that you've read it, before you start writing code, take some of the paper in the test booklet um, or off to the side and let's think about the algorithm itself. And this might save you some time, even though we may take a minute or two to go through the algorithm, this might save you time from writing code that you realize, oh, I didn't need that, or that code is wrong, or spend a little bit of time thinking before you write. It always comes in handy. So let's talk about the algorithm that we need for part B, because there's a lot of methods and, and everything else that gets called. So I'm supposed to return a new 2D array that contains the non-zero rows. So what's the first thing I should do? I should probably create a new 2D array. Well, then my first question is going to be, how big should it be? Well, 
the array, I know I'm going to need a certain number of rows, certain number of columns. Uh, the number of columns should be the same, right? But oh, there's not going to be as many rows. How many rows do we need? Oh, right. That I have a method that I can call. So let's, before I even create my 2D array, I should call num non-zero rows to find out how many rows I'm actually going to need, right? Because this, two, this new 2D array is going to have only a certain number of rows, the ones that are not zeros, that have no zeros in it. So now I'm going to create a new 2D array and I'm going to use that num non-zero rows as the number of rows. And I already know how many columns I'm going to need because that's the same as my original. Okay. Now what do I do? Well, I'm going to have to iterate over all of the rows in my 2D array, right? And I have to, let's see, I got to determine if a row is a non-zero row. How do I do that? Oh, that's right. We have a helper method to see if a row is contains zeros or not. I got to call that is non-zero row. So notice these are the two helper methods this is where they're going to come into play. And if it doesn't contain zeros, right, then I'm going to copy each column, copy the values from each column uh, to into a row in the new array, right? Um, and I'm going to iterate over all the columns in there, right? Well, well, hold on, if I copy that in, which I know what row I'm going to copy from, which row am I going to copy to? See how this gets really complicated? Got to think it through first. I'm going to need something to keep track of every time I add a row because it's not going to be the same number row, right, as the original array because my new array could be smaller. So since I'm going to need to keep track of something, let's scoot all this stuff down and let's create a, look what I did right here, create a new row index. So that's going to keep track of each new row that I add. So I'm going to know where I'm at in my new 2D array as I add in all of the non-zero rows. So after I copy each column to a row, then I'm going to increment my new row index. And then when I'm finished, then I'm going to return my new array. Whew. Rob, I'm exhausted. I haven't even written any code yet. There's a lot going on there, but but Tim, I got to tell you, that is such great advice to actually sit down and just kind of sketch out what the algorithm is going to do first. I think that'll right. be really, really valuable on on all the free response questions. I hope so. And and you don't have to go complete sentences and, and a nice little uh, 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 outline like this, but just even if you write some notes down to yourself, because that way you won't find yourself erasing code or, or trying to stick code in with arrows and things like that. So... Now that we've gone through the algorithm, and, and if you want to pause here and, and kind of take notes of what we did here, what I'd like you to do is now I want you to try to write part B. So here's part B. This is my resize method. You're going to take in that array 2D, and you're going to give me a new 2D array that is possibly smaller that only contains non-zero rows. So why don't we go ahead and hit pause here, and let's give part B a shot. Has it been 10 minutes? 12? Somewhere yeah. in there? 10, 10 to 12, maybe 15, somewhere in there. There we go. Okay, great. Hey, let's come back now. So uh, we are going to do part B. So let's look at part B. So what do we do first? Well, we need to create our 2D array, right? Oh, but we need to know how many rows there's going to be in our new 2D array. So what do we do? We call that num non-zero rows, right? We're going to call num non-zero rows. We're going to send it the array 2D that we have. And notice I'm just calling the method because it's in the same class that I'm writing. So I don't have to say class.method. I just say method. Notice it's going to return a value here that into a, a value that I'm calling num rows. And now when I create my 2D array, I'm going to use num rows to represent the number of rows. And then I'm going to use array 2D zero dot length for the number of columns. Because the number of columns, I know that's going to match my array 2D, right? OK, what was the next thing we have to do? We need that row index. Remember, because we have to keep track as we're putting our rows in. So I'm going to create a new row index. And I'm going to set it equal to 0. So that's my integer here. And so now I need to traverse. Now. I'm going to go through each row. So here's where my nested loops come into play. So I'm going to go through the rows of my 2D array. Notice two, array 2D dot length, right? And as I go through the rows, what do I need to check for? I need to check to see, is this row a non-zero row? So here's where the other method comes into play. This is one I wrote back in part A. I'm going to call is non-zero row. And I have to send it 
array 2D and send it R. R is the row that I'm on. If it's a non-zero row, then what do I want to do? Now I want to loop through my columns. So again, this is a kind of a take on that, uh, a variation on the nested for loops that we have. We're traversing through the number of rows and then the columns in each row, but we're only going to traverse through the columns if we know it's a non-zero row. So here's my traversal through the columns of my 2D array. And so I say for nc equals zero, c less than array 2D zero dot length, right? Or um, I could have used result dot length as well too, because the number of columns or result zero dot length, because number of columns are the same either way. And what am I going to do? So now I need to take everything, all of the column values from array 2D and put them into the column values of the result 2D array. And here's the assignment statement. Now notice a couple of things. Result row index C, because I'm going to be starting at the whatever row I'm currently on for result, but I'm going to be using row R for my 2D, for my array 2D, the original array, and then notice the column C and column C in both. So I'm copying from the non-zero row that I found in array 2D, and I'm copying them into the next row of result that I'm currently on. And once I do all of that, I then need to increment my new row index, new row index plus plus, and then I'm done with my if statement, and I'm done with my for loop, and I go back up and I go to the next row, and I do all of this all over again. Once I'm done going through all the different rows, and every time I find a non-zero row, I copy all the columns into my columns of result. Then what do I do? The last thing, don't forget the last, most important last step here. I've got to return my 2D array. So I'm going to return results. And that's part B. How'd we do? Notice there's a lot there. There's so many things there that I think you're, you're capable of getting but it's very easy to miss whether it's the index numbers or where the if statements are, or how the traversal works. So keep that in mind as you're going through and hope you did pretty well. And I hope you take some of those strategies as we look at our 2D arrays. All right, just real quick, I wanna go over um, some of the things that, uh, that are, are extremely important to, to note that uh, you'll get scored on. You know, did you, did you call num non-zero rows and is non-zero row? Did you create an array of the correct size? Did you traverse all the necessary elements of our array? Did you identify the rows that have no zeros? Did you maintain the index, right? We said that's important as well. And then did you copy all and only the appropriate rows uh, into the new array? If you did all that, then you're gonna be in great shape. And there's our 2D array. So uh, Rob, as we finish up, what should we take away here? I'll go ahead and stop sharing and it's back to you. Okay, let me grab the screen. Okay, there we go. So um, as far as our takeaways today, we had today's bit of the day. Um, I spent some time looking at AP Classroom and some of our AP daily videos that are out there, um, some specifics and some things from maybe last year and some, some great insight from some university instructors that you might wanna go out and check out at some point. Um, Tim did some review of nested for loops and then we looked at multiple choice questions and looked at um, how we would use array traversals and nested for loops um, to traverse a 2D array in a multiple choice question setting. And then Tim gave us some great, uh, advice and insight with the Array Resizer 2021 free response question. Um, so that's pretty much what we've covered today. Let's talk a bit about next week's video, uh, or I should say tomorrow's video. Um, next week's bit of the day, um, I guess I guess today is Thursday. So is the, uh, this is the last one we're doing this week, This is Rob. the last one of our week. You're right. Um, time flies. So this is a bit about next week's video. Next week's bit of the day, we're going to take a, a, a look at the Java quick reference sheet that you'll have access to while you take the exam. Um, we're going to do a little more review of class methods. Remember, we touched base on that earlier this week. Um, we're going to do a little more multiple choice question review. And then we're going to kind of shift gears. I know we've covered all four questions from the 2021 exam. Um, we're going to look at the digits question from the 2017 uh, exam. That'll be our first free response question we look at next week. So um, so hopefully uh, you'll have a great weekend. Um, join us back here on Monday. It was great having, having everyone here. We appreciate you joining us. And, Thanks so uh, much. Yeah, have a great day and we'll we'll see you next time. Take care.